This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. This weekend, we're featuring a talk Jeff recently gave at a meeting of America's Future Foundation on the topic of why smaller is better. Jeff discusses radical political federalism, the Swiss model, and how every aspect of human life is becoming more decentralized, except governance. I wanted to start out just talking about a, uh, a conversation I had recently. A, a good friend of ours from Switzerland named Claudio Gross was in Auburn visiting. Claudio is a hardcore libertarian and a big gold guy. He helps people, he helps rich people uh, put their physical gold and other physical assets in storage vaults in Switzerland where they're totally outside the banking system. So you get, the, you get a sense of what kind of guy he is. And so we were talking about the Swiss federalist system, the system of subsidiarity. And it started to dawn on me more and more as, a, as I spoke to him, something that I already knew and that we all already know instinctively, but we don't always um, know clearly. And that is that as we try to persuade people and as we try to win hearts and minds, it's easier if we do that with fewer people. Right? We're always wondering, what's the best way to spread liberty? What's the best strategy for libertarianism? Well, maybe it's smaller political subdivisions as opposed to trying to win over these big countries like America with 320 million people. And so after talking to Claudio, I took some time on the Swiss government's website. And that's one of the handouts here on Swiss federalism. And it's just unbelievable because our, our constitution gives lip service to federalism. It wasn't followed for very long. Well, it really only followed for a few decades. But what, what really struck me about the Swiss government's website was the humility of this website. There's so much hubris in American politics. We expect these national politicians to have the answer for everything under the sun. And so you're reading this website and you realize how like, humble it is. It says, well, basically anything can be done at the local level. We don't touch and we push all decision making down. And the principle of subsidiarity is what governs us. And I was thinking, can you imagine having, hearing Hillary Clinton or Donald yeah. Trump last year on the campaign trail in, you know, in Jackson, Mississippi or in Anchorage or in Miami or, or any place saying, you know, it's great. Thank you all for being here tonight. I don't really know Anchorage or Jackson. So what we're going to do is we're going to let you guys decide that to the extent possible. So knock yourselves out and thanks very much. You, you know, this is just unthinkable in American politics. We expect our federal politicians to be these omnipotent masters of health care and budgets and taxes and environmentalism and global warming. And it's just an absurd system when you've got 320 million people. But what, what I really liked about this handout on, on the Swiss uh, government's website was this, this clause here in a sentence that says, federalism makes an important contribution to social cohesion. I was thinking about that and I thought, God, we could use some of that in the United States right now. I mean, we're so divided politically and there was so much nastiness really following the rise of Trump and then the entire unbearable 2016 campaign and then now since Trump's elected. And I think we could actually learn quite a bit from the Swiss when it comes to social cohesion. And, and maybe the number one lesson we could learn from them is that smaller is better. And, and that's not only true politically, but also in terms of social cohesion and peace. And I, that's something that, that's really struck me, and it's something I think we don't think about enough as libertarians. So there's this unpleasant undercurrent to American politics, especially since Trump won the election. And, and there's actually people on both on the left and the right talking seriously about using the word civil war and using the term secession. And these aren't just people on the, on the extreme fringes uh, saying these kinds of things. Even people who are more mainstream conservatives and liberals. Uh, the, the one article I would recommend to you is from a guy named Angelo Cotavilla. And he wrote an article in the Claremont Review of books called The Cold Civil War. Now he's not a, he's not a crazy guy or an outlandish guy. He, he's what I would call a doctrinaire conservative. Uh, on the left there was a, a seminal article in the New Republic called Blue Exit. Blue Exit. I don't know if you heard about this. It came out in March of 2017. It was very strong to saying look these red states are crazy, it's time for us to turn our backs on them, it's time for us to go our separate ways. And this is the new republic. This isn't some radical part uh, of the left, but, but really a mainstream part of it. And, and of course, since Trump won, our friends on the left have discovered federalism. 
and states' rights in spades, and they're talking about uh, sanctuary cities and this kind of thing. So let me give you a quote from this gentleman in the New Republic. He says, we won't formally secede in the Civil War sense of the word. We'll still be a part of the United States, at least on paper, but we'll turn our back on the federal government in every way we can, just like you've been urging everyone to do for years, and devote our hard and resources to building up our own cities and states. And I thought to myself, if that's a threat, I'll take it. I, it. You know, it sounds a lot like Switzerland, as a matter of fact. So I thought I would pose to you guys a, a, a little bit of a thought experiment. I don't know how familiar any of you are with the San Francisco Bay Area, but I've lived there myself. My wife has lived there. Uh, when we were first dating, we lived there, and we've, we've actually lived there in two different times. So the San Francisco Bay Area is made up of about 8 million folks in about nine counties. And these are some of the bluest counties in the country. They reliably vote 80 or 90% for Democrats, and not just Democrats, but Pelosi-type Democrats. Um, you know, very left-wing in, in outlook. So imagine if we allowed those nine counties, right here, right now, a, a wide degree of localism and subsidiary like the Swiss system. Uh, imagine if those counties could decide right here, right now, without needing any federal governance, without needing any federal laws, to have the whole panoply of what most people on the left right want right now, which would be uh, climate change regulations, progressive taxation, uh, maybe uh, limits on income, some kind of universal health care system within those nine counties, uh, maybe very strict regulations or even prohibitions on firearms, uh, free public housing, free public education, make Cal Berkeley free. Uh, you know, would anyone in this room really object to this? Now, we might say, you know, that's not going to work because, for instance, free public health care carries all the wrong incentives uh, for people to overconsume and underpay and that, it, and that there's no rational price mechanism. Same thing for education, etc. So we might say that technically that's not going to work or pragmatically that's not going to work. But would anyone in this room object to them trying it no. or having it for themselves? And my answer is, is, is absolutely no. And, and I don't like this idea that people in the San Francisco Bay Area have to fear the election of some, what they consider redneck senator from some southern state, like this guy we're apparently going to elect in Alabama. Um, yeah, the, the former Supreme Court Justice Roy Moore. I mean, people in, in blue states and blue cities, actually, that, that's, that, that causes them fear and apprehension. What kind of system is this for 320 million people where you have to worry about some state three, two or 3,000 miles away electing someone? And really, at the end of the day, Americans are governed by about 535 knuckleheads in Washington, D.C., and about uh, nine sport Supreme Court justices. If you go back to colonial times and the number of U.S. representatives and extrapolate forward to, to modern day, there should be about 10,000 members of Congress. Unless you're really out in a rural area, your member of Congress should live within a mile or so of you. You should see him or her at the grocery store. They should kind of know you, and they should kind of a little bit fear you in terms, of, in terms of having to see you after casting some vote. But the system we have now, every member of Congress has about 700,000 constituents. It's not working. And I, and I think the Swiss system works a lot better. So let's, let's think about this in terms of what we see happening right now in Catalonia. This is, a, this is a very serious situation where the central Spanish government has federal police. And they're sending those federal police in violently to suppress elections, uh, to tear down polling stations, to, to uh, seize ballot boxes, this kind of thing. Um, this is really pretty unprecedented. I happen to know uh, a fair number of libertarians who live in Europe, and I, I also know three or four really dedicated Spanish libertarians, and they're even split on this. Some are like, no, 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 Jeff, you're all wrong. The people behind this are left wing, and they want to have a real sort of communist Catalonia. They want to be really aligned with the EU. Uh, they're socialist in mindset, and they're going to have, people are going to have less freedom. So this isn't libertarian. This result is not, there's nothing libertarian about this, and you're out to lunch. And then there's other Spanish libertarians I've talked to who said, no, you know what? I'm in Madrid, let them go, uh, I, I can live with this. But what I'd like to suggest is that there's, there's a difference between the principle of secession and the question of whether secession in any given circumstance is a good idea. 
Right? It's two different things. One's a principle, one's sort of a factual question. Uh, you, you know, but Catalonia is not some backwater. This isn't some uh, uh, economically depressed part of Europe or part of Spain. This is a, 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 an, an economically vibrant region that also happens to contain the city of Barcelona, which is one of the great capitals of Europe, if not the world. So this isn't an academic question. Uh, now it's not up to us. It's not up to us as Americans and, and non-interventionists to decide for them. But I think we should embrace the idea that smaller is better when it comes to governments and political arrangements. I think any time a central government gives up power and turf, whether that's over the number of human bodies they profess to govern or the, or the number of kilometers or miles that, they, that it uh, holds sway over, I think that's a good thing. And I think it, the proof of this is in the pudding because central governments in Madrid, in Brussels, the EU, in Washington DC, they resist it so mightily. And whenever I see central governments resisting something with all their might, it, it leads me to believe that it's probably a good thing. Uh, you know, at some point, we'd, we'd, I, I, I would imagine most of us in this room would say we ought to have 7.5 billion self-governing autonomous humans on, on Earth. Right now we have about 195 countries. At some point we've got to have 196. At some point we've got to have 200. At some point we've got to have 300. We're a long way from 7.5 billion. But, uh, you know, I, I personally think that we ought to be supporting the principle of subsidiary and secession, whether or not the facts on the ground, the history, the ethnography, the language, whatever it might be, uh, argues for or against Catalonia and the outcome there. So, as libertarians, our response to this nasty politicization of society that we really saw ramped up in 2016 is to make politics matter less, correct? It's to, we do this by making government matter less, by making government less powerful and thus less fearsome and, and lowering the political stakes and the political rhetoric and the political hatred. We want to create a, a, a system where people in the San Francisco Bay Area don't have to fear some redneck senator from Alabama. But how we do this, how we get from A to B, uh, you know, it's been a tough question for libertarians. Uh, I'm sure Rand didn't do as well as most of us might thought he was going to do in, in, in New Hampshire or otherwise, in Iowa. Um, Gary Johnson didn't do very, did very well uh, as a libertarian candidate, ended up not getting into the debates. But, you know, there's more to it than that. We've become obsessed as libertarians or as liberty-minded people with this idea of national politics and figuring out how to create some 51% electoral majority to change society. And in the current reality, that comes out to about 65 million people. Uh, that's a lot of hearts and minds. And I think because of this, we, we have risked, we've lost sight of what's really this undercurrent, the, the dominant trend of our age, which is radically decentralized systems. And as I mentioned, I think for libertarians, smaller is better. And I think for progressives and conservatives, smaller is better too. This isn't a, a zero-sum fight that we have to engage in necessarily. And as a matter of fact, I think we ought to be doing the opposite. We ought to be looking at win-win solutions. So if we think about the last two big revolutions in society, the agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution, these are actually somewhat centralizing in effect. Um, agriculture uh, caused people to stop being nomadic, to get food and, and come together onto farms and to work in agricultural concerns. The Industrial Revolution took people out of rural areas and brought them into cities and big firms and big factories like General Motors um, and brought them together geographically into cities. So those were both centralizing revolutions. But the digital revolution, the revolution that we might say started, you could say it started in the 70s, but I think it really got going in, in force in the, in the 1990s. Uh, the digital revolution decentralizes us. It moves the world in the other direction. And really every aspect of human life that we can think of is becoming decentralized. Uh, commerce, think of uh, uh, firms like Amazon uh, all over the world. Business hierarchies are becoming flatter and decentralized IT, not only information technology, but the, the spread, the dissemination of information itself. Uh, money and banking becoming highly decentralized. Even, even group affiliations and loyalties are becoming decentralized because if you have a particular interest or a particular hobby or a particular desire or love, 
you can connect now with people all over the world. You're not just limited to the libertarians who might be in your town or to the people who like your hobby uh, who might be in your town or, or you're looking to buy a used car. You're no longer just stuck with the used cars in your town. You, you've got the internet. Uh, you know, and this has really been the trend of our times. I, I mean, you know, you go to the, the uh, what do you call it, the freestyle machine. <laughs> At the fast food place, you've got, you know, 150 different combinations of soda. It's just unbelievable. So if we think of information as the new product of the digital age, then it's increasingly dispersed. So this revolution is a little bit different. Uh, the digital age not only does it disperse us, but it, it, it changes the way organizations work, and that includes government. You, you know, you think of decentralized networks like Google or Amazon, and then you think of the old hub and spoke models that would particularly of governments and empires. Think of the British Empire and India and, and, and all of its colonies. Whereas today we think of, of servers and information and networks are kind of more clusters of, of lights or, or almost like spider webs. Uh, they're more like Hulu or Netflix as opposed to you know, the big three networks that we all remember from our childhood and they're, they're kind of static programming. So why is, you know, why is Google Google, at, at least in terms of its management style? Well, because it uses flat management. It has decentralized teams that work on things. And companies that do that, at least at the moment, are prospering. And companies that are old line and they're thinking like we might look at GM that had to be bailed out. Or we might look at IBM, which has lost it, it's, it, the luster it had in our parents' and grandparents' age. Um, Google's Google because it uses decentralized management. So the digital age, if I had to put it into one word, is the age of disintermediaries, right? Both human and technological. A disintermediary is anything or anyone that eliminates the middleman, the middleman being the intermediary in a process. So this is really the central theme of the digital age. So that's why we now have peer-to-peer -peer transactions like Uber, you know, there's no dispatcher, there's no taxi company per se. Uh, we have Bitcoin, which doesn't require a, a central bank or a state propping up a central bank. Uh, Google is sort of an inter intermediary. We're finding out some more and more bad things about Google. But still, it, there's no library involved. There's no professor standing between you and all the information at your fingertips on your phone or whatever via Google. So now, without any real intermediary, we have access to almost all the world's accumulated knowledge in a little device in our pockets. It's amazing if you think about it. Now that, ladies and gentlemen, is, is decentralization at work. So if we think about the Catalan people who are, who are marching in the streets right now, they view the Madrid government as an unnecessary intermediary that they need to eliminate. And secession for them is the process of disintermediation. So at least until they replace the devil they know maybe in Madrid with the, with the devil they don't know in Brussels, but in, in the midst of all this change, of all this decentralization, only one part of human life's going the other direction, governance. I mean, it's almost unbelievable when you think about it that we allow this. Only governments are becoming more hierarchical and more bureaucratic. We think in the United States, the trend over the last 100 years has been to federalize more and more of what used to be done at the state and local level. We think of Europe, what used to be done in national uh, or regional countries is now done at Brussels uh, in the, in the, under the European Union, or it's done in Frankfurt in the European Central Bank as opposed to uh, independent central banks. We see this, this centralization um, in, in all areas of government, in, even in, in quasi-government organizations like the United Nations, like the International Monetary Fund. These are not only uh, centralizing federally in a certain country, they're actually centralizing supranationally amongst amongst different, or I should say supranationally, uh, across different countries. So globalism is the order of the day for governments. And why on earth should libertarians support this? I don't know if any of you read Michael Malice or know who he is. He appears on Fox News sometimes. And he wrote an article the other day, he says, only politics remains binary. So with politics, it's always either or, it's always zero sum, and it's always win-lose. And we don't accept this in the marketplace. It's amazing that we accept it in, in government. So I want to make a distinction, though. When the, when the political class talks about globalism as a good thing, 
What they mean is political globalism. And this is this, what I would consider illiberal doctrine that what's, what's good for X politically is necessarily good for Y. And it's, it's always, you notice, a world run by people just like them. Uh, it, it's never about you. And what they mean by, by globalism is sameness. They mean universal political arrangements that are all going to culminate in what they see as kind of an approved social democracy model with, with, no, with only nominal national sovereignty and diminishing national sovereignty. But the, the problem with this is that political globalism is, is actually quite illiberal and it can even veer towards authoritarianism because it reduces the ability of the average person to have a say in how they're governed. Political matters increasingly are decided someplace far away. It's the opposite of Uber and Bitcoin and Google. So if, some poor, if somebody in Jackson is trying to fight a fight with the city council, um, you know, fighting that fight at the city level versus the state level versus the federal level becomes harder and harder. And what's, what happens when they have to fight something at the international level? Is their voice stronger? No, it's clearly weaker. So in the sense of political globalism, I would argue that it's illiberal and it's something we ought to oppose. Now, now this, this form of globalism is not at all what Ludwig von Mises meant by globalism. When he talks about it, he saw it as this economic phenomenon that actually emphasizes the differences between places, not the sameness. The, the differences ex expressed in the division of labor, in specialization, and comparative advantage between places. If China can make a t-shirt for five bucks and get it to Walmart, let them do it. We don't need to create a $10 t-shirt in America just because. I mean, this is, this is what Mises meant by globalism was trade, and trade is based on differences, different co comparative advantages between countries and people, because if we're all the same, then we'd have no reason to trade with each other. We all have the same goods and services, the same expertise. So Mises saw the, the right to self-determination as the highest political value. It, which, if we allowed it to happen, if we allowed the world to express itself the way the Swiss allows its cantons to express themselves, what we'd have is real diversity, not this phony baloney diversity that they talk about in terms of globalism. So if, if we, the people in this room, if we think that people should be free as individuals to make their own choices, even choices we might think are bad, then they must also be free to do so as groups. I think it is consistent to argue, and that extends to places like Catalonia. So again, we're talking about political globalism. You know, I'm not worried about globalism that arises through the marketplace, whether it's economic or cultural or social. To the extent these things represent market preferences, to the extent the world just says, hey, certain things really are better. We all like Diet Coke. We all like Honda Accords. Um, <laughs> that's fine. But when these preferences are sort of install, instilled or installed in countries by nefarious mechanisms like NGOs, then, then I think we have a real cause for concern. So, you know, talking to Emil earlier and, and knowing what I've known over the years about AFF, they actually, AFF, to the, for those of you who are familiar, actually has a beautiful building, a townhouse that they own in DuPont Circle area of DC where they hold events. Um, you know, presumably the reason you, you're involved with AFF is because you care about, about creating a more libertarian and more prosperous society. But we've all struggled, I think, with the question of, of what's the best strategy, what's the best tactical approach to go about this. And, it, and if the answer to this was crystal clear, we'd, we'd presumably all be doing it. Um, but there's always costs involved. I, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the great Thomas Sowell. Whenever, when, when people ask him a question, he always says, well, compared to what? That's always the question, uh, not just for us. But uh, for our opponents, we, there's always questions that we always have to think about choices and costs involved and respond to this sort of utopia trap that we sometimes find ourselves in when people are, are questioning libertarianism. So we can boil it down, I think, to, to really two basic choices. There's a great book written in 1970 by a uh, sociologist and social theorist named Albert Hirschman. It's called Exit, Voice, and Loyalty little thin book, about 180 pages. I'm curious if anyone's ever heard of it. It's one of those sleeper books. I really recommend. It's a little dry, but uh, it, it holds up really well. That's, almost, that's 45, 50 years now. 1970, Exit, Voice, and Loyalty by a guy named Albert Hirschman. 
So the theme of the book is that all organizations, including governments, tend to deteriorate over time. That they, their, their product or their service gets worse. And this, this, of course, tends to make customers unhappy or citizens unhappy, which leaves them, like it leaves us, with two basic choices, which are voice and exit. Either change things to make them better or leave them. So you, we voice our displeasure or, or we exit and switch to a competitor to the extent that's possible. But you know, loyalty tends to slow this process down. Loyalty to the brand, to the monarch in, in previous uh, centuries, to the state, it tends to postpone our willingness to exit. Uh, it's a form of political inertia. But, but on the other hand, the idea that we have a voice or the possibility that we have a voice to change things, uh, the, the, or the possibility of exiting makes our voice more important. So these two things kind of work in tandem, voice and exit. We all understand this with consumer products. Uh, we like to think that we have choices, but governments for an awfully long time have, have gotten away with murder, both literally and figuratively, because they've only given lip service to, to voice, while exit, which means expatriating, leaving the country, historically has been very different, very difficult for all but the most wealthy people in any given society. But I think the digital age, the decentralized age, uh, stands to change this profoundly. And, I, and I'm optimistic about that. I'm, I'm encouraged about that. So within this framework of voice and exit, uh, I'll, I'll leave you with, with sort of the three choices we might have, or three, three very basic choices of how we might go about uh, making things better for ourselves. And the first, of course, is politics. And, you know, I, I understand we all have felt the desire to scratch this itch. And the, the, the thing about engaging in politics is it gives you something tangible. There's a filing deadline, there's fundraising, there's a primary, there's election. You, you go work for Rand Paul in his campaign that you have, you have sort of tangible primaries and tangible vote totals and these things, whereas uh, just promoting liberty in other ways has a sort of vague and unsatisfactory feel to it. Uh, but the thing about policies is they're really, really difficult. Uh, as you all know, the odds are stacked against us in a million different ways, uh, not only in, in what's a, a damnably difficult two-party system, but also in the money game. And just the situation in Washington, I mean, uh, you know, when I worked for Ron Paul, he, he basically used his seat as an educational tool. But when it comes to really uh, uh, getting bills passed or preventing bills from getting passed, you know, we send some good people to Washington like Thomas Massey and Rand Paul, but it's, it's a very difficult environment. And you have to remind yourself that we've had a century of progressive victories. You know, that's the baseline in, uh, in which we operate. The, the progressives won the 20th century. They won central banking, they won social insurance, they won the welfare state, they won the interventionist military state. And by progressives, I don't necessarily mean left, I mean left and right progressives, people who want an activist government. Um, and so that leaves us now, 100 years later, where the, the sort of the, the debate is always framed as what should government do about X? So when that's the question, liberty-minded people are already on their heels because we don't accept that framework. Our question is, should government even be involved in X? Uh, so we shouldn't kid ourselves about how difficult the political environment really is, at least at the national level. So the second approach that a lot of us use, and certainly the one the Mises Institute has chosen to use, is education, winning hearts and minds. Now this is a little less tangible, it's a little more vague than engaging in politics and having races, but um, you know, a lot of people would argue that this is, is really what matters, that politics is downstream from culture anyway, so you might as well roll up your sleeves and get to work. Um, I mean, it's a long game, it, it's not necessarily for people in a hurry, uh, and there's really two ways to, to view the education game, top down or bottom up. Uh, the top-down approach was, was promoted by Friedrich Hayek, who said, well, he, here's what we ought to do. We ought to get uh, uh, liberty-minded scholars ought to invade academia and start to uh, win over academics to our point of view. And those academics will, will set the stage and create the ideas for a media class below them to disseminate information to the masses. So it's kind of a, a, a top-down approach. And, 
And if we look at academia in the, in the 20th century, now 21st, I, I don't think it's working. Um, you know, there's a flaw in Hayek's thinking, and that is that academics have self-interest too, just like the rest of us. And, and for most of them, the system works, and they have an interest, a self-interest in perpetuating it, writing these dopey academic papers that nobody reads, but that's how you get tenure, that's how you advance, that's how you become a department chair. Um, and, and they're kind of comfortable. It's a pretty good gig if you can get tenure. So the top-down approach hasn't worked so well. Murray Rothbard argued for a bottom-up approach. He said, hey, let's not be afraid as libertarians to be populist in our thinking. And, and that rubs a lot of people the wrong way because we, we like to think of ourselves as more of an intellectual movement and a movement that's based on ideas. But, it, but if we think about it, populism isn't an ideology per se. Populism is a, a tactic. You, you can imbue populism with whatever you want. And I would argue that Ron Paul used populism uh, very skillfully in two different senses. One, he said, get out of Iraq. Get out of the Middle East. Now, that's a populist message that resonated with people who were sick of these wars, who didn't see an American interest in them anymore, and saw the, the amount of money and the amount of carnage we were spending. Um, so that was certainly a populist message. The other populist message he used to great effect was end the Fed. That's not complicated. That appeals to the average person. I mean, does the average guy or gal understand the mechanics of how the Fed operates and how it enriches certain people at the expense of others? Well, probably not, but is, since when is that a crime? I, I mean, most monetary economists can't explain to you the mechanics of how the Fed operates. So, you know, simplifying things and, and approaching the masses and using populism, I think, uh, can be a great approach. Just, just think, um, think of it this way. When, when elites get that way, when elites become elites because they're state connected, then being anti-elite is A-OK, -okay, right? Th think of uh, pharmaceutical cartels. Think of AIG and the bailouts it had as a, as a monster insurance company after the 08 crash. Think about Wall Street bonuses that are based on phony baloney uh, equity market prices. Or just think of equity markets in general and, and uh, crazy real estate spikes in places like Manhattan and San Francisco. Um, I, I would argue that we ought to be a little more open to a common touch and to a populist argument within, within the parameters of, of what we know to be right. So we've got politics, we've got winning hearts and minds, and then we've got the third approach, which is secession, decentralization, subsidiary, localism, nullification, basically trying by hook or by crook to apply a, a Swiss model to our lives. So this we would call exit as opposed to voice. Now exit can take a lot of different forms. It doesn't necessarily mean in the digital age that people have to physically segregate themselves. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean we have to have a violent conflict or a secessionist movement or that a certain region of the United States has to break off from the rest. I mean, there's, there's a, a lot of ways short of that that I think people can secede uh, digitally. Uh, j just like you and your neighbor don't have to have the same cable package or the same uh, cell phone provider, uh, it's not that hard to imagine a world 20 or 30 or 50 years from now where you and your neighbor have one, one of you opts into Social Security and one of you opts out. Uh, one of you opts into Medicare, one of you opts out. There's a million permutations that we could think of for this, but I think that at some point we have to recognize that walking away from Washington, D.C., literally or figuratively, might be more attractive to us than trying to win over that 51% electorate, uh, also known as 65 million people. So, in, in closing, can, this is what conservatives and progressives spent the 20th century arguing about political universalism. Uh, even libertarians spent the 20th century, to the extent they had a voice, arguing for universal political principles. We all believe in universal principles of self-ownership, private property, uh, basic individual sanctity. But political universalism is a different can of worms. And what we're finding in the 21st century is that what we imagine to be universal norms and attitudes are not as widely agreed upon as we might think. And in a really a hyper-connected digital age, I think elites are going to find it increasingly difficult uh, to make the case for globalism against this, this tide of secessionist movements, breakaway movements, populist movements. And I think libertarians should embrace this. 
I think they should embrace this reality and reject political universalism for a, a, not only a tactically superior and more palatable vision, but maybe even a morally more palatable vision of radical self-determination. So with that, thank you very much. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.